Father in heaven, thank you so much for waking us up this morning, for giving us a new day of life. Father, thank you that it's the Sabbath that is present outside and that we have this house of worship to come to on your day to study your word. And Father, I pray now as we as we enter into these, these uh, moments here where we consider Bible study methods, I just pray that it would be useful to us. Lord, that somebody here that's seated here would would be uh, inspired and motivated, would, would feel that they have some tools that they could use in order to, to have an experience in the Word on a daily basis. Please uh, make this time edifying for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I start, I have to tell you about my friend Omar, who's from Colombia, South American preacher. And Omar... Uh, has a passion for ministry, for evangelism. So he decides that he's going to go into the jungles of Colombia to reach out to the, to the people living out in the villages and in the different remote sections of the country. I don't know how much you know about Colombia, but Colombia is a very dangerous place. It has a lot of guerrilla army and guerrilla soldiers who basically take control over regions of the country, and uh, the government can't control them. So Omar goes out on foot to the different uh, sections of the country to reach out to these people. He tells the story, he told me the story, that one day as he was approaching a village, before he entered the village, there was a group of soldiers that were guarding the entrance. And as he got closer, they came out with their big guns and they were pointing their guns in his face and they began to scream at him, who are you, what do you want, where are you coming from? What do you want here? And they took him aside, they surrounded him, and Omar was getting really nervous. And as they put their, gun, their guns to his face, they said, what do you want? What are you doing here? Omar said, sir, I'm just an evangelist. I'm just here bringing the word of God to share the gospel with the people of your village. And they take their guns and they point at him and they say, what church are you from? Now what would you do if someone points their, their, their machine guns in your face and says, what church are you from? Some of you might be tempted to say, you know, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Baptist. Right? You'd be nervous. You don't know what's coming. Omar said, sir, I'm, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Let me say amen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then the, the soldier says, prove it. And Omar's like, what? They say, prove it. Prove to us that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. And Omar says, what do you want me to do? And the leader of the group says, reveal to us from the Bible the 2300-day prophecy right now and prove to us that you're a seven-day Adventist Christian. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. Okay. What would you do is, if you were at gunpoint, asked to prove that you are an Adventist Christian and to prove it, you had to take your Bible right there on the spot and give a group of soldiers with machine guns a Bible study on a 2300 day prophecy in the book of Zed. How many of you would be toast? Come on, let's be honest. We'd be toast. Right? Omar says, Do you mind if I have a little prayer before I get started? How many of you would have said that? And you would probably look for the quickest route to run, right? He goes aside, he gets in his knees, and he prays, and he says, Father in heaven, I need your help right about now. Help me. Remind me of the things that I've studied before. Incidentally, guys, you understand that God cannot remind us of something we have not previously put in our head. Amen. Right? Because Lord, remind me. In Jesus' name, amen. He comes out, he whips his Bible out, and he gives his group of soldiers a Bible study on the 2300 day prophecy in Daniel. And at the end of which, the leader of that, of that group of soldiers says, you've proven yourself. You're welcome into this village. And if anybody gives you any problems, you come talk to me. Amen. When he told me that story, the first thing that came to my mind was, have mercy. Where would I have been in that situation? When he told me the story, the thing that came to my, my mind was the urgency for us 
to have a personal study experience where we would be able to bear testimony for our faith before the highest tribunals in this world. Amen? Which is exactly what Ellen White tells us will happen soon. So it's probably a good idea for us to get into the Word and to develop Bible study methods that work for us and that we actually get something out of the Word. Amen? Amen. Okay, anyways. I'm going to share a quick thing on the Bible study pyramid. I found this to be the most helpful uh, little steps in a long time. I ran into this book called How to Apply the Bible, and it blew me away. This is a summary. In your little handout that you have, you should have a few pages here that will sort of summarize what we're going to cover. And I'm going to move fast here for the sake of time, so just follow with me. This is not an exhaustive presentation. There's much more that could be said on this. This is just a quick thing to get us thinking in the right direction. It's expected that we would take these things home with us and put them to practice. The Bible study pyramid. First of all, this is basically what it, what it, what it looks like, okay? The pyramid obviously has a peak at the top, yeah? When we approach any passage in the Bible, okay, we approach it from the left here. Any passage of the Bible is like a big mountain. It's like a pyramid, okay? Every passage has a peak on top, all right? So when we approach it, we need to climb. We need to what, everybody? We need to climb the text. We need to climb that promise. We need to climb that chapter. We need to climb that passage of scripture, right? Now, the process of climbing is the process of reading. It's when we read. And when we're reading, we're investigators, all right? Young people, we're investigators. And investigators ask a lot of questions. That's what they do. They ask questions, right? And so the process of reading, what we want to know is, what does this say? What does it actually say? So we're asking the question, what? So I don't know if you have pencils with you, but there's a little line on the read. And in that line, you write the word, what? That's what we want to know, OK? As we're investigating, we're getting all of the data yeah, all of the data, all of the information that we can gather from any given text. And once we've done that, we then are on top of... Uh -oh. We have a problem. I think it's under that chair. No. Here we go. Under that first section is the what. Once we figure out the what, we climb up on the mountain, on the pinnacle, right? Now we're standing on top of the text. And why do we want to stand on top of the text? Because when we stand on top of the mountain, we get a beautiful panoramic picture. We get a beautiful view on top of the text of everything around, right? So we're trying to comprehend what we've just read. We've gathered the data. Now we want to know what is the significance of this data? What does this stuff actually mean? Okay? Now, it's important to read, right? But what good is it to read the Bible if we don't know what the Bible is meaning to say? Right? If we don't know what it means, it doesn't matter what we're reading. Right? When we are on top, we're asking the question, so what? And you would write that down on the little line on top there. So the what, and then the so what, and once we once we discover the so what on top of the, the, the pyramid, then we can now descend the pyramid again on the other side. And why are we trying to descend? Because we want to get back down to earth. We want to get back down to daily living, okay? And then when we descend, what we're doing is we're now saying, what am I going to do with what I've read? What am I going to do with what I've discovered? How am I going to apply this to my life? And the question we're asking is, now what? So what, so what, now what? Can you say that with me, guys? What, so what, now what? If we just remember that and apply that, we would walk away from the Bible with a new experience. What, so what, now what? Here's another way to look at it, guys. Um, and for some reason, it's not changing on the screen. Changing now? There we go. Another way to look at it is the reading aspect is we're trying to figure out what did this passage mean in time? 
Okay, you would write down in your little line there, in time. Basically, in its own time. When the passage was originally written, what did it mean back then? Okay, when we discovered what the passage meant when it was originally written and to whom it was originally written, then we can climb on top of the passage and because we know what it meant in the past, then we can take our syringe and extract from the passage the principle, okay? What this means in a timeless setting. You write down timeless on top. What does this passage mean to every generation in every time in this earth's history? So in its own time, in the past, original setting, on top, what's the timeless application? What is it in this passage that applies to every time? And then we descend down and we're trying to apply it. Remember the now what? And by that, we're trying to figure out what is the timely meaning of this passage. You write down timely there. So in time, timeless, we're up on the pinnacle, and then timely. If that's clear, can you say amen? amen? These are the steps in every passage that we read, every text that we read. Everything we're trying to understand, we need to view it like a pyramid. We need to view it like a mountain. And we're looking on top, and we need to climb it, get our view, then walk back down and apply what we've just learned to daily living. Okay? So here's the question. How do we climb? And how do we descend? It takes one step at a time. Amen? So if you have, if you have a little pencil, you might want to write these things down. Because in your handout, it just has the steps here that you'll fill in as we go along. The first step in our climbing is... People, you notice they all start with the P to help us remember, okay? People. Then it's place. What is the place of this, of this passage? Then the third step is the plot. Okay? People, place, plot, and then finally, the point. The point. Now remember, this is just ascending the pyramid. This is just reading, collecting data being investigative reporters, asking a thousand questions in order to arrive at answers. I, I think uh, somebody once told me, ask stupid questions to arrive at smart answers. Yes. Ask stupid questions to arrive at smart answers. How many of you have ever had this experience? It happens to me every day. I'm reading my Bible, and I'll read something, and I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Anybody? I'm the only one? Okay. That happens to me all the time. And I get so overwhelmed with what I'm reading. It seems to be so complex. And it's so overwhelming that it's far easier just to close my Bible back up and to walk away. Right? But if I were to just sit there and ask the stupid questions. What, what I mean by stupid is simple questions. By asking simple questions, we arrive at deep answers. Okay? So that's what we're doing. So people, place, plot, point. And once we've discovered the point... We climb on top, and now we're at principles, and we descend to the present. Remember I told you the descent is going back to earth, back to your life, to daily living. Present, parallels, priorities, and the bottom step is what's your game plan? What is your plan? What are you going to do? What we're going to do now in the next several minutes is we're going to go step by step and briefly point out what this stuff looks like, okay? What each of these steps look like and what kind of questions we should be asking at each of these steps as we're climbing and as we're descending, yeah? Okay, here we go. The first step, people. Help me out, folks. Why, why do you think that the first thing we should be looking for as investigators is the people in the passage? Any guesses? Why would that be your most basic question, your most basic data that you look for? Okay. Who wrote the Bible? Don't say God. People. Okay, people wrote the Bible inspired by the Spirit of God. People wrote the Bible, right? Who did these people who wrote the Bible write to? Some more people, right? And who are you who are reading the Bible? What are you? You're people, right? The reason we look for people is because that's the most obvious, that's the most simple thing to look. How many of you guys have ever done a, a, a puzzle, put a puzzle together? 
Okay, when you crack the box open and you scatter all the pieces, what are the first pieces in the puzzles, uh, uh, puzzle pieces that you look for? The what? The corners. Why do you look for the corners first? Because the corners are the most obvious pieces to look for. What's obvious about them? They're corners, right? They have two, two flat edges, right? They're easy to spot, so you look for them first. Once you get your four corners, then what do you do? You look for the edges, right? Why? Because they're the second most obvious things to look for. They have a flat end. You see what I'm saying? In making a puzzle, what we do is we look for the obvious first to set a framework, and then we fill the framework with the details of the puzzle. We do the same thing when we read the Bible. We read a text. The first question is, is should be the most basic question, right? The edges, then the, the corners, then the edges, and then we fill in. So this is the corners, the people. So what is it that, uh, that we're looking for? Human nature hasn't changed much since biblical times. Do you believe that? People are still struggling with sin. Yeah? People are still struggling with, with, with surrendering to the will of God, just like they were in biblical times. We look for people because we find in people similarities that we can apply to our own life. So, we would ask these types of questions. Who are all the people in this passage? How are these people like people in my world? What characteristics in myself do I see represented in these people? There's a couple examples I could give you, okay? But we won't go too much into that. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, if you open to Matthew chapter 1, you'll find there a genealogy. How many of you love genealogies? You think they're really interesting to read? Anybody? Genealogies are tough, aren't they? So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and you're thinking, they could have saved a lot of paper had they skipped that part, right? Why did they include that, right? Well, check this out. In Matthew chapter 1, when you read the genealogy of Christ, if you pay close attention to who in the world are these people anyways, you'll discover that there's a powerful message in the listing of these people. For example, in the genealogy of Jesus, you find some pretty shady characters. Amen? You find prostitutes. You read it. You find someone who was the result of an illicit relationship. You find someone who was a descendant of a nation that was hated by the Jews. When you read the genealogy, you find that the reason the Bible lists these individual people is because it's trying to make a point. Jesus, Jesus is related to the low, the outcast of society. See what I'm saying? When you read, you ask yourself, who are these people? And you realize you thought there was nothing there, but actually there was a powerful message there for you. Okay, I'm going to move on, even though there's so many good examples of that. You guys follow what I'm saying? Can I move on? Okay. Number two, place. Place. This is the second most obvious thing that I would ask myself when I'm reading a passage. Why do we ask the question of place? Because it sets it in its original setting, okay? What is the historical and cultural and geographical setting of this passage? By taking this step, we can put ourselves in the situation as it originally took place. Okay, how do we find out more about the place in a passage? There's some tools that we need to get used to using. Using There's Bible dictionaries, there's encyclopedias, there are study Bibles that many of you have here. These are tools that we use in order to dig deeper to figure out more information about the place, okay? For example, how many of you have read the letter that Paul wrote, 1st and 2nd Corinthians? Anybody ever read anything in 1st and 2nd Corinthians? Let me ask you a question. Where was Corinth? He's writing to the what? Corinthians. What does that mean? Where do they live? They live in Corinth. Okay, where is Corinth? Okay. What is Corinth like? What was Corinth like? What were the issues in Corinth? What was happening 
in Corinth that Paul had to write all of the crazy stuff he wrote to the Corinthians. See what I'm saying? Most of us don't ask those questions, right? We just read the letter to the Corinthians without asking those preliminary questions. If we were to ask those questions, when you read the letters to the Corinthians, it would make so much more sense what you're reading. Because you have a context for why this stuff was written to those individuals. Does that make sense? Yes or no? For example, Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, you have the story of Jesus. He's 12 years old. His parents take him into Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Yeah? Remember the story. Then the parents leave Jerusalem to go back home. And the Bible says they left Jesus behind. Right? How many, how, how many days did it take for them to find Jesus again? Three days. Check this out. If you were to read that story and ask yourself the question, where did this take place? What was the geography of this? When... Jesus' parents left him in Jerusalem to go back home. Which direction did they go? And what was that trip like? Right? This is a powerful question. Why? Because if you look into it, you discover that when they left Jerusalem, they left Jesus behind in one day. But to leave Jerusalem, you had to go downhill. What, everybody? Downhill. They got downhill. They realized Jesus is not here. They had to go back to Jerusalem. And now they have to go what? Uphill. Is there a sermon there, brothers and sisters? There's a sermon right there. Right? Anytime we leave Jesus, it's easy to leave Jesus behind. It's downhill, right? But when you leave Jesus behind and you got to go back and find him, what do you got to do? You got to truck it uphill, right? It takes a lot more energy. It takes a lot more sweat and a lot more pain to make it back up that hill to the city on the hill. You with me? If you looked at geography, you would have a sermon before you even got to any details of, of the story. Right? Last one. We got to move. Exodus 13. When the, when the Israelites were delivered from, from uh, Egypt and they were taken into the promised land, we're told, and we don't have time to read this, but we're told that God took them not the direct route, but that God had to take the long way around in order for them to get there. How long did it take them? Oh, how long was the journey in the wilderness? 40 years. Do you folks know how long the distance actually was to get from Egypt to the promised land? It was some 240 miles. Now I understand they didn't have cars back then. But 240 miles and 40 years. That doesn't really go with me. What about you? They could have made it a lot sooner, right? In the history of Israel, just by looking at geography, it completely amplifies the text. Are you with me? Can I move on? We need to ask questions. What is the setting of this passage? What are the significance in the details, in the history, culture, geography? What are the similarities to my world today? That's the second step up. We're trucking up. Third step, the plot. The plot. Namely, what in the world is happening in the text that I'm reading? Why is the plot important? Because what the plot does is it considers the first three points, right? And what, what, or it's taking us to the third point, it considers the first two points, and it basically is trying to unravel the tension that's taking place in the passage. It's pretty interesting when you think about this. Did you realize every passage in scripture was written to address some problem? Yes? Every passage in scripture was written to address some problem or to encourage folks in some sort of situation, right? Would it be helpful to know what that problem was before we, we look at the addressing of the problem? Would it, doesn't it just make sense, right? The plot helps us to determine that. Because when we understand the plot, then we get what was actually being said. There's a lot of examples here. Um, I'm just going to move on. I'm not sure how we're going to make this time. Questions to ask for the plot. What is happening in this passage? What is the conflict or the tension? And just seriously, this will change your Bible study experience. When you read the Bible, have a notepad next to you. When you read a passage, stop. Take your notepad out and, and ask the question, what is the conflict or the tension in this passage? And just start. And you will be amazed on how the word just comes alive after you do that. Another question. 
what would I have done in this situation? What would I have done in the situation that the passage presents? Another question. How is this similar to what is happening in my life or in the world today? Are these good questions? Plot. Once we've dis determined the plot, we take the next, the final step in our ascent before we're on top of the mountain, and that final step is the point. What is the point? Okay? And in the point, essentially what we're trying to determine is what it all of this meant to the original audience. What it meant to the original audience. We too often jump the gun in trying to interpret something, trying to understand what it means to us without first understanding what it meant to the original audience. And that's why we run into problems. Did you folks realize that there are entire denominations in the Christian church and in the Christian world that are founded upon one or two texts that have been misinterpreted. Isn't that wild? A whole church founded on a few verses that have been misinterpreted. Why? Because they're trying to apply something that they have not first determined what was the application in its original sense. Why do we have so many issues with the Sabbath? Because people will read some verses in Romans chapter 14 and Colossians chapter 2, and they read verses, and they come to conclusions that seem to imply to them that the Sabbath is no longer significant without asking the question, the people who read this originally, what message did they walk away with? What was the original intention in this passage? And once we do that, we, re we realize that we're not looking at the text properly. So um, what do we ask? What was the intended message uh, for the original audience? What did the people in this passage learn? What did God want them to do? This is critical. Not what does God want me to do. What did God want them to do? What was God's solution to their problem? What was God's solution to their problem? For example, can somebody whip out your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5? By way of example, Matthew chapter 5. And whoever gets to Matthew chapter 5, can you say amen loud and clear? Amen. I need a volunteer to read clearly verses 29 and 30, Matthew chapter 5. are causing you to sin, pluck your eye out. If your hand is causing you to sin, chop it off. Right? Now I understand not everyone is this crazy, but there are people in history that have literally followed this through to its conclusion. You with me? Here's a perfect example of where it would be probably intelligent to ask the question, what did these words mean to the original audience? What did Jesus expect his original audience to get with these words? And if I can determine that, then I'll know, what is Jesus expecting me to get out of this passage? Does that make sense? Folks, help me out here briefly. Was Jesus literally expecting his original audience to go and poke their eyes out and chop up their arms? No. We determine that by reading everything else Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. To walk away with that there would be something that would contradict everything else Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You with me? We don't have time to really get into that, but I'm just trying to give you a quick example. Okay? The point helps us arrive at our next step, which is the principle. Okay? It helps us arrive at the principle. Why? Because by knowing how it applies to them, we know how we can extract principles in the passage that apply to every generation. So, in the principles, this is essentially what we're trying to ask. We're trying to ask, what is the message for all of humankind? 
What is the message for all of humankind? What are the timeless truths? And what is the moral of the story? Okay, back to the fourth step on the point. Back to chopping off your arm and, and plucking out your eye. What was the original message? What, what was it that he was getting at to his original audience? Summarize it for me in your own words. He wanted them to know what? Yeah, yeah. His point originally, take by any means necessary, separate yourself from things that cause you to sin against God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And to make that point, Jesus gets radical when he talks about plucking at your eye and chopping off your arm. But what he's trying to communicate is take drastic measures of removing from your life anything that causes you to stumble. Okay? That was the point. Now check this out. Take your needle, take your syringe, and extract from that point a timeless principle that applies to all of humankind. Right? And it's essentially the same thing. The principle there that applies is in your life and my life, we ought to identify those things that cause us to stumble, and we ought to take drastic measures to separate us from those things in order to protect ourselves from falling. Amen? That's the principle. So, what is the message for all humankind? What is the timeless truth? And what is the moral of the story? We're on top. We get this beautiful, uh, this be beautiful vision and picture of this amazing biblical principle that applies to our life, and now we need to come back down to earth, right? We need to come back down to earth. And this, the descent of the pyramid, is arguably the most important part of the pyramid, amen? What good is it, folks, if we read the Bible till we're blue, if we know the details, the information, the theory, what good is it if we know what it meant to the people back in the day? What good is it if we know the principle that applies to humanity if we don't come back down to earth and apply it to our everyday lives? I want to say something here. We are professionals at investigating scripture. We're professionals at interpretation. We as a people have the proper tools to arrive at truth. We even pat ourselves on the back, right? We have the truth. We love to say stuff like that, right? Here's what we're not so good at. Actually applying gospel truth to everyday living. That's what we're not good at. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to get to. Okay, so we're stepping down. Step number six now is the first step down from the mountain. And it's the present step. Present. Okay, what are we trying to do with the present? Here's what we're trying to do. We are then trying to take the point and the principle that we just arrived at, and we're trying to add our lives into the equation. In other words, put me in the picture of this passage. Okay? We want to take this passage now, bring it down from heaven, and apply it to my everyday life. Here's the questions we ask. What does this principle mean for my society and my culture? How is this relevant to me? What from back then is similar to today? How can I make the timeless truth timely in my personal life? That's the present step, which is followed by parallels. Step number seven. Parallels, this is what parallels is all about. In every one of our lives, if you think about it, our life is categorized in different departments. Right? We, have, we, we, we have different compartments in our life, different areas in our life. For example, my home life, okay? For some of us, my academic life, my vocational life, my work, okay? My business life, my church life, and just my life in the world in general, right? There are different categories, different compartments in every one of our lives, home, school, work, church, and the world around me. What is parallels? Here's what parallels is like. Try to do this. Try to do this and, and, and tell me if it doesn't change your experience. You take a passage of scripture that's challenging, you take out a notebook, and you write down those categories. Home. Then you write down work. Then you write down school, to whom it may apply. Then you write down church, and so forth. Those are different categories. Then you ask yourself the question, how does 
this principle apply specifically in every one of those categories in my life? Okay? What we're doing now, folks, is we're taking the text and we're getting down to business. How is this text going to change my perspective in every category of my life? Okay? For example, going back to the chopping your hand and plucking your eyes. This will be our example we'll use. I need to take, Jeffrey needs to take drastic measures, okay? Drastic measures to separate myself from things that cause me to stumble spiritually. Okay, let's get down to business, folks. My home life. My home life. What about my home life? What are the things in my home life that cause me to stumble? How am I going to apply this text in my home life? Okay? And you get down specific. Then you move into your work life. At work, what are the things at work that cause me to compromise my faith? What are the areas or the challenges at work that cause me to stumble? And you would write that down. And so forth and so forth and so forth and so forth. And we'll realize, little by little, that the verse, before it was very vague, before it was very uh, general, and it could apply to anything under the sun, but now it's getting very, very specific. Are you with me? I'm going to read you a passage real quick. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. The way of a fool is wise in his own eyes, but, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Okay, I can take that. I say, does that apply to my home life? And I can say, wait a second. I'm always getting into arguments with my wife. Because my attitude of I always know everything and I'm always right and I always like to challenge is something that I need to work on. It's something that I wrestle with. And I need the word of God to change my attitude in my home life in this specific situation. Are you with me? The reason I'm, I'm harping on this so much is because it's far easier to read it and say, Oh, yes, Lord, help me to be more of a patient person. In Jesus' name, amen. Whoa, 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 wait a second. No, 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 back it up. What do you mean? Patient in what sense? In what type of situation? What do I need, why do, what do I need patience in? You see what I'm saying? And with who is it most difficult to be patient? See what I'm saying? Why is it that our prayer lives are so weak? And I, I'm speaking generally, okay? Why is it that oftentimes our prayer life is so weak? I want to suggest something. Could it be that our prayers are so general that it's difficult to even know when that prayer was answered because it's so general? You see what I'm saying? What if our prayers were specific? Then we would begin to notice, Lord, have mercy. God just answered my prayer. I just prayed last Tuesday about this. And look, he answered my prayer. See what I'm saying? You guys with me? Little man is with me. All right, good. I don't know about you, but this has drastically changed my life. This has drastically changed my life. Okay, I'm going to move on. The next step, well, I should just read the question real quick. How does this, what does this truth mean for me? Where are my areas of need, conviction, and opportunity? Where in my life might this truth possibly apply? Now, sister, you haven't given me the 10 minute yet. Okay. We're good? All right. After parallels, here's where it gets good. We move into priorities. By the way, we can take parallels and we, we can just raise our hands and, and propose different verses. And we can take it back to the, to the notebook. Say, all right, how does that touch home in my home life? How does that touch my work life? How does that touch at work or at, at church or what have you? Priorities. Priorities. Okay, guys, we're almost done. Follow me here. Priorities. Here's where we take those categories that we just found. And we say, where does this hit the hardest? Which category in my life, which area in my life does this passage hit home the hardest? Where am I going to prioritize the application of this passage? Are you with me? Enough of this general stuff. Lord, help me be more loving. How in the world, how in the world are we ever to know if God answered that prayer? Help me be more loving. You know what I'm saying? If we get specific, priorities. How should I adjust my priorities? 
what should change, what should I change about my values, my beliefs, my attitudes, or my character? What about my thoughts and motives should change? What kind of person does God want me to become? We essentially narrow it down, and we ask ourselves the question, which area of my life? For example, you might say, you might take the passage I shared about, a fool is wise in his own eyes, but he who takes counsel is really wise. And you might say, at home, I don't struggle with that. I don't struggle with that at home. At work, that's a piece of cake. And then you get to church life, and you say, at church, and then you'll hear a bell, bing, and you'll say, have mercy. There's that elder, there's that deaconess, there's that sister in church. I cannot stand that woman. You know what I'm saying? And so what normally happens is when we read a text, our sinful nature will automatically gravitate toward that area of life, that area of life where we don't struggle with it. You with me? You don't not, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We don't naturally go to the part where it strikes home. We go to the area where we don't really struggle with it. But by prioritizing, by getting those parallels down, we begin to realize, whoa, there are areas where this stuff actually hits home. And finally, the last step is the plan. This is the most important step of all. The plan. What's the game plan? What am I going to do about it? Okay? It's interesting. We have certain attitudes toward our spiritual journey that we don't have towards any other area in our life. In every other area in our life, we're very logical, we're, 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 we're clear thinking, but then when it comes to spirituality, we're just like, Lord, help me. For example, anybody here ever try to lose weight? My wife is trying to get me to exercise and go to the gym. I hate going to the gym, right? I despise it. Amen, Brother Hush. But here's the thing. I want to be all buff and muscular like some of you guys here. But I don't really want to do anything about it. You know what I'm saying? I wish there was some pills you could pop and it could just do it, right? But I know that unless I hit the gym, nothing's going to happen. As you can see, nothing has happened. You know what I'm saying? I know that, right? I know that unless I have a game plan where I'm hitting it every day and I'm getting... Uh, Discipline and so forth, nothing's going to happen. I need a game plan, right? But then when it comes to our spiritual journey, we say, Lord, I need help here. I say, Lord, help me. And the Lord almost say, okay, yeah, what's your game plan? You, we're basically saying, Lord, give me the pills. Let me pop the pills. The Lord says, there's no pills. You have to have a game plan. Are you with me? All right. So we make plans to live differently. What do we mean? We have to set a goal. A what, everybody? A goal. When's the last time you read a text in Scripture and said, Lord, help me with that, took out a sheet of paper and said, okay, here's my one, two, three plan. In order to arrive at applying this text so that it produces life change, I'm going to, number one, boom, boom, boom. Number two, boom, boom, boom. Number three, that's my game plan. And Lord, this is the goal that I'm going to to, to uh, set in order to be a more humble person and to have a better attitude towards yada yada. When's the last time we did that? I know I'm not the only one that doesn't do that. In fact, I should even ask who has done that here. Don't raise your hand. But I can ask that question, right? Because most of us don't do that. See what I'm saying? All right. These are the steps that we take. And I'm going to do a quick shot, uh, machine gun summary of how this looks like with the text of scripture, how we can just breeze through it, climb it, and descend it. We're going to take John 13. Sister, what I got? Five minutes left? John 13, beginning in verse 12. I need a volunteer, and we need to read this quickly. Then we're going to go to the screen, climb it, take a peek on top, descend it, and live it out. John 13. Somebody there with a loud your voice. John, let me get there real quick. 13, we're reading from verses 12 to 15. This is the passage where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Sir, loud and clear, everybody listen clearly. 
12, 13. So after he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and, and was set down again. He said unto them, Know he what I have done to you? He called me Master and Lord. And he said, Well, so, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, he also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that he should do as I have done to you. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. Familiar with this passage? Yes. All right. We're going to climb it, take a peak, and descend it. Amen? Who are the people in this passage? Jesus is there. His disciples are there. Judas is there. And if you, if you look at the context, the devil himself is there checking it out as well. Okay? These are the people involved in the passage. What's the place? Where is it taking place? It's a private dinner in a private location between Jesus and his disciples. Okay? What is the plot? Here's the plot. This is taking place a few days before Passover. Now what happened at Passover? Okay. If you notice chapter 12, it's basically pointing us to Calvary. This is basically happening a few days before Jesus' life on earth ends. Okay, this is significant in other words. The act came as a shock to the disciples. Why? Because in their culture, only, or I should say, important people don't do this in the culture. You don't find a dignified, professional man on his knees cleaning the feet of another person. You with me? And here you have Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, in this humble act of service. And the, the text tells us specifically that Jesus knew that he was the conqueror of the universe. He was all-powerful, and he's on his knees washing dirty feet. You with me? That's the plot. These are the same guys who were arguing just a few moments prior about who's the greatest. And you have the greatest on his knees watching their dirty feet. You with me? That's the tension. That's the tension in the passage. What's the point? What's the point? Jesus was using this act of humble service as an example that they should follow. Their values and philosophy of life was to be different than the world. How do we arrive at that point? Because you just noticed in the, in the data that their cultural setting would have been shocked at what he did. So what is Jesus saying? You as a Christian should not get sucked into your cultural setting. Right? You see how we arrived at that conclusion? He wanted them to be servants to one another just like God himself had exemplified. In order to truly understand God and be united with him, they should embrace the spirit of humble service that God himself exemplified. Everything I've written down here is a summary of the point that Jesus was hoping that they would walk away with. Okay? This is what the passage meant in its original setting. Now we are on top of the mountain and we take a peek. What is the eternal principle? Take your syringe and extract that. What's the eternal principle that applies? That those who are truly disciples of Christ will embrace a spirit of service toward the world around them. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's what applies to everyone. They are humble and genuine. No act of service is too demeaning or humble for the disciples of Jesus. They are other-centered, not self-centered. That's the eternal principle. But we got to walk down to planet Earth. Present. Jesus may not be asking me to wash someone's feet today, but he does want me to embrace a spirit of humble service for those around me, even in unnoticed and un or in thankless tasks. See that? You may not literally be washing people's feet today, but the attitude necessary to wash someone's feet is an attitude that should characterize your other acts that you do perform today. Make sense? Parallel, when at home, work, or church, I tend to enjoy serving in the spotlight when I'm noticed and praised, when, when people applaud at me. I tend to avoid tasks that I won't get credit for. See, you see how now it's beginning to touch home. It's beginning to make me feel uncomfortable. Conviction is, is beginning to start because we're beginning to apply it. Okay, those are the parallels. And here's the priority. I can say at church, 
I'm a servant. I serve at church. At work, I serve. But then when I get home, I might think, Lord, have mercy. I should seek to alleviate, and forgive me, husband, for doing this. Don't hate me. This is just an example. I should seek to alleviate my wife's burden by helping around the house. Amen. Okay, so this is what we're doing here. We're not talking about washing people's feet, are we? But we are extracting the principle of washing feet into everyday life. Now, there's husbands here that help their wives around the house. I'm, I'm just saying this would be an application for me. You with me? That's the priority. So I can say, Lord, help me be more helpful to my wife around the house. In Jesus' name, amen. Or I can say, what's my game plan? What's my game plan? Get a piece of paper out and say, Lord, these are the goals that I'm going to set. I will schedule the every several days out of the week where I can take care of the dishes at home. I will cook supper once a week. Okay? Now, this is not for everybody. This is just a silly example of how you might apply a text, which is for me something that would apply. For you, it will be something different. What I'm trying to say is, I can, in the, in the course of one month, look back at my, at my life with my wife, and just because I read a little passage in John chapter 13, I can begin to notice that my relationship with my wife will begin to change because I climbed up John 13, I took a peek, and I walked it right back down to daily living. And it, it would literally change my life at home. Are you with me? Summary, what? So what? Now what? What did it mean in time? What is the timeless application? What is the timely? And these are the steps. I want to encourage you as we're out of time. I want to challenge you not just to read the Bible, but to read the Bible responsibly, to apply it to daily life. Until we do that, really, it's still meaningless, and it lacks the power for change in life. How many of you want to make a commitment with me? Lord, help me to be more intentional this week and the weeks to follow in my reading of the Bible, and help me to take the steps to extract from it the power that can change aspects of my life. How many of you want to say, Lord, I want to make that commitment? Okay. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we raise our hands because you know every one of us here. You know our hearts. You know that many of us here really want to commune with you in your word. And Father, I pray that we would have a game plan, that when we go home today, tonight, tomorrow morning, that we would set a game plan to set reasonable goals so that we could begin to see your power in our lives. In Jesus' name we thank you and we praise you. Amen.